songwriter told a story in an interview about when she was a homeless teenager. She said, I had bad kidneys and I couldn't really afford medication and I, I kept getting sick and I kept missing work and I kept getting fired from new jobs. I was really never able to get back on my feet and it was during this time I had a very brief career with shoplifting. It was food mostly and I justified it because although one day it looked as though uh, it, could, it could escalate. I was walking down the street and I saw a sundress in a storefront window and I coveted it. I went in there and I tried it on and I thought about stealing it. I had the price tag in my hand and it was one of those moments in life like a lightning bolt struck me. It was $39.99. And I thought, when did I lose faith in myself? When did I start thinking that I couldn't earn $40 on my own? She goes, I was so suddenly insulted and I realized I wasn't cheating anybody except for myself. I left. I didn't steal the dress. I quit shoplifting, I quit shoplifting at that moment and started writing these lyrics. If you watch what your hands are doing, you can see where your life is going. Whether they're stealing or writing things are probably going to be two very different futures. So I wrote this song about that and my hands. The songwriter was Jewel Kilcher. The song was Hands, which reached the top of the charts in the late 1990s. And while I can't remember any of the verses, I can remember this one line from the chorus, and maybe some of you can too. She sings, in the end, only kindness Think about that line again. She says, if you watch what your hands are doing, you can see where your life is going to go. What are your hands doing these days? Making fists? Shaking fists at the sky? Pointing fingers at others? Throwing your hands up in exasperation? What our hands are doing is usually an indication, an extension of reflection of what's happening in our heart, at the very core of our souls. Our hands are often an extension of where the kindness meter sits in our lives. And the kindness meter in our lives is a prediction of where our relationships are headed. Which is why next week, starting a week from today, November the 1st, we're encouraging all of you who are call Central Home or maybe you're just visiting today to try and experiment with us. It's called the Kindness Project. And when this service is over, you'll have a chance to go out into the lobby. You can also download one of these online. It's a 30-day kindness challenge. Every single day, you have a, a very specific description or challenge that you can try in order to cultivate practices of kindness in your life to work on specifically one relationship that needs improvement. Now, if you're an overachiever and you want to work on four relationships, knock yourself out. <laughs> My guess is that some of us have, have room to do it multiple dimensions. But when the service is over, you're going to have a chance to pick one of these up. If you're in a small group, our challenge is going to be for you to tell your small group leader that you're doing this and who the person is that you're trying to extend kindness in towards and then have some accountability in that particular domain. We're going to talk more about that at the end of the service. But I believe that we move the kindness needle in the, in the kind of mercy gauge in our lives when we cultivate practices of kindness instead of just trying to be nice. Because the truth is, every single one of us can play politely. Most of us learn this at kindergarten. There is a difference between refusing to be cruel and actually being proactively kind. Some of you remember a couple decades ago, somebody came out with this bumper sticker that says, practice random acts of kindness. That's not, what we're, that's not what we're gunning for here. We're gunning for strategic practices of kindness. Not kindness that we do haphazardly, although I think spontaneous acts of kindness will flow out of a kind heart. But we're trying to say, God, will you show me how I can cut a pathway of kindness in my brain and in my heart so that my posture towards this person is different tomorrow than it was today. And I think that we can start this kind of life when we understand how six kinds of kindness impact other people for good. And these six kinds of kindness, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is one that uh, kind of sparked in my imagination over the last couple days. There are six kinds of kindness, and like in true preaching fashion, they all start with the letter P. They are passive kindness, permissive kindness, 
proximate kindness, promotional kindness, plentiful kindness, and powerful kindness. Let's go ahead and break it down. First kind of kindness is passive kindness. Passive kindness is when you don't do anything at all. Passive kindness is at the heart of forgiveness. Passive kindness says, in this moment, I will withhold hostility from you. How many of you ever heard a well-meaning teacher or parent say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. So the first step of kindness sometimes is doing nothing. Especially when the something that you are prompted to do is something unkind. So we've got a whole seven days before we launch this challenge. And for some of us, the, the kind of the hard tilling that we need to do in the soil of our heart is just to root out all of the hostility before this challenge begins. And maybe for us, the very first step in this process is like, all right, Lord, I'm going to do six days of nothing. Some of us have been so hurt, and I had a season in my life not all that long ago, when the primary emotion that I had when I rolled out of bed was vengeance. Like, that's just a straight-up confession that is a testament to my own spiritual immaturity. But, like, on my way to get, like, my morning breakfast smoothie in the kitchen, I would be like, oh, Lord, will you give that person what they deserve? That's not a good prayer to start your day with. And God is saying, like, Steve, how about you just start your day with nothing? How about we just cleanse the mental slate? Because you're not starting at zero. You're, like, starting in the negative. It's not a good look for you. Genesis 19 tells the story of a guy by the name of Lot who had kind of lived a, a shady life, had kind of made choices that weren't honoring to God, was living in a place, Sodom and Gomorrah, maybe some of you have heard the story, that was not honoring to God. And God finally says, I'm going to destroy the city. He goes, Lot, I'm going to give you one chance to run for your life. These angels tell Lot, Lot, um, here's the deal. The clock starts now. you got to make it to those mountains. If you don't make it to the mountains, you're going to die. Apparently Lot was out of shape. He's like, I can't make it that far. Will you let me like get halfway there and not kill me? And the angels go, fine. But here's the prayer that he prays in Genesis 19. He says, your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. And God says, fine, you can stop here. What does he say? He goes, you have shown me great kindness in sparing my life. The first act of kindness sometimes is not giving somebody what they deserve, even if they deserve it, and even if you have the ability to mete out vengeance. We have another example of this. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, there's a guy who would eventually become King David. He had a close personal friend who was a prince. His name was Jonathan. Problem was, David knew that he was eventually going to get Jonathan's slot as the future ruler of the kingdom. Jonathan's father, Saul, was so filled with rage that he kept trying to kill David. And Jonathan was having this, this kind of parting ways conversation with David. He goes, when you are king, will you show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness so that I will not be killed? Like the lowest bar for kindness in the Bible is choosing not to hurt somebody even if you have a platform to do so. Now, if trust has already been broken in a key relationship in your life, I want to say as clearly as I can, the first act of kindness is for you to do nothing. Proverbs 24 says, do not gloat when your enemy's enemy falls. It says, do not testify against your neighbor without cause. Do not say, I'll pay them back for what they did. Romans says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge. Do not overcome Evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. In passive kindness, we cancel cruelty. We misplace our malice. We release our resentment. And we refuse to harm others with our words and deeds. So if you have somebody that you are struggling with, you might want to write that person's name on a post-it note or on a bookmark for your Bible or on your kindness tracker and say, God, for the next six days, will you help me to not Will you help me to erase any thought that jumps into my brain that is hostile? Will you stop at my lips any word of gossip, slander, or malice? Will you root out from my heart the toxicity that threatens not only to derail this relationship, but all of my other ones as well? If you want to start from zero towards kindness, your first act of passive kindness is choose to Think nothing ill of another person. 
Some of us, that's going to keep us busy, maybe not just for the next week, but it could keep us busy through the next, oh, I don't know, uh, election season. <laughs> You're laughing because it's true, right? First, first kind of kindness is passive kindness. The second form of kindness is permissive kindness. Permissive kindness is hospitality. Permissive kindness says, I welcome you into my space so that you can heal or rest. Or breathe. The scriptures tell a story of a woman by the name of Naomi, and she had to flee her native Israel because of an intense famine. She moved to a country named Moab. When she was there, her two sons married two Moabite women, and over time she lost her husband and she lost both of her sons, and she was just there with her two daughters-in-law. And eventually the tide turned back in her homeland and it was time for her to go home. And with her two daughters, she left the place where she had been living and set out on that road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. Naomi is telling her daughters-in-law, You created a space where we were desperate for us to land on our feet. When we were at death's door, at our time of great desperation, you created a safe place for us to develop relationships, to experience love, to stop our grieving, and to know hope again. 1 Samuel 15 repeats this message. The king Saul was attacking a city, and then he said to one of the tribes within that city, he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites, so that I do not destroy you along with them, for you showed kindness to the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. Maybe kindness is as simple as welcoming somebody in. Maybe to your emotional space or maybe even into your physical space. Kindness brings outsiders into our circle even when it's not easy or comfortable. So if it's physically safe to do so and the person that God is asking you to extend kindness Two, doesn't live in your home, consider inviting them over to break bread. Or if it is a person who's already in your home, invite them to a moment, maybe where you go out for coffee or you go for a walk or you go on a short trip so that you can create a safe space for them to start over. How many of us know that many of the people that we're showing a kind, want to show kindness to are hard to show kindness to because they are fighting a battle that we don't know anything about? And when we understand that hurt people hurt people, we know that some people aren't able to receive kindness because they're, they can barely have their, like, nose above the waterline. And sometimes permissive kindness just says, like, come in and rest and heal and reset. Permissive kindness is the, is the act of hospitality. So passive kindness is forgiveness. Permissive kindness is hospitality. And then we've got this next one, which is called, I call proximate kindness. Proximate kindness is blessing other people in that person's sphere. Proximate kindness says, I value not only you, but I value everyone attached to you. In the Old Testament scriptures, kindness wasn't just individual. It was tribal. When you wanted to show kindness to someone, you showed kindness to everyone in their community. Now, we talked a little bit about the fact that King Saul was trying to kill King David. And despite that fact, David, even though he had every right to hate everybody that was attached to Saul, he made a commitment to Saul's son, Jonathan, that whether you are alive or dead, I'm going to show kindness to everyone in your line. Now, why was that risky for a king? Because back in the day, if the bloodline of the king before you was still alive, that person was a threat to your throne. So for David to choose to show kindness to every one of Saul's descendants was politically and physically risky. There was always the chance that they would rise up against him, that they would hire assassins, that they would stab him in his sleep and take over the throne. But David said, I made a vow to my friend that I would show kindness to him. And so I want to show kindness to everyone who's attached to him. So there's a very intense battle. Saul lost his life, and both of Saul's sons were killed as well. So Jonathan, David's friend, was also killed. And later on down the road, we read this. David asked, is there still no one alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? 
And Ziba, one of his officials, answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, He's at the house of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makir, the son of Amiel. And when Mehibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mehibosheth, at your service, he replied. He goes, don't be afraid. Why would he be afraid? Because David had every right to kill him. David said to him, I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. So he goes, not only, not only do you have to not fear for your physical safety, but your family's inheritance is going to be restored, and you don't have to pay another food bill for the rest of your life. Mahibosheth is like, I think I just won the lottery. Some of us have circumstances where we cannot show kindness to a person that we feel like God is prompting us to honor, maybe because they're not here anymore. Maybe they're no longer living. Maybe they're no longer local. But that doesn't mean that the story is over. For David, the kindness project meant seeking out someone that he could bless as a proxy, as a symbolic representative of the person that he wanted to honor. Lavish kindness is when you include a whole family in your kindness endeavor. Lavish kindness is when you're like, I know God wants me to be kind of that person, but maybe I'm not there yet. Maybe, maybe I don't feel safe, or maybe I haven't healed, or maybe I haven't forgiven enough to get to them yet. But you know what I can do? I'm going to show kindness to the person who delivers their mail. Or I'm going to show kindness to the person who plows their snow. Or I'm going to show kindness to their kids, or their nephews, or their neighbors. And I'm going to start at the edge, and I'm going to slowly work my way into the center. I had a friend who had a broken business relationship. And somebody that he had taken a major risk to involve in a, to, to get into a business endeavor with, it, the whole thing blew up. And he had a hard time figuring out how he could show kindness to the person who, who brought him into that, who, who betrayed him, who broke promises along the way. And as he was praying, he felt like God was saying, I want you to, um, I want you to write a text encouraging that person's son. Because he's going through a battle of his own. And, and I remember this guy telling me, like, I, I don't want to do that. I don't know how to do that, but he did. Why? Because he was trying to exercise the whole idea of proximate kindness. To be able to say kindness isn't a laser. Kindness is a grenade that includes a bunch of people into its positive healing blast zone. So when you think about kindness, think about passive kindness, just forgiveness. Think about permissive kindness, welcoming somebody, permitting somebody to come into your space, hospitality. Think about proximate kindness, blessing somebody who is next to the person that you want to be kind to. And then think about this. Think about promotional kindness. How can you advocate for somebody else when they need someone to vouch for them or go to bat for them? Promotional kindness says, I will advocate for your well-being. Some of you may have heard the story in the Bible of a guy by the name of Joseph. Long story short. Joseph was kind of immature as a teenager. He did some shady things. Nevertheless, his brothers did him violently wrong by selling him into slavery. He was a victim of human trafficking. Eventually, he was in jail for crimes that he did not commit. But God's hand was on his life. And he had this amazing ability to interpret dreams of people who came into his space. So the king of Egypt, is, they called him a pharaoh, he had two people who had offended him, a cupbearer like his butler and a baker. And they both had dreams, and so Joseph interpreted their dreams. But listen to what Joseph says to them as he prepares to translate their dreams for them. In Genesis 40, he says, when all goes well with you, he's saying this to the cupbearer, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Joseph needed the butler to advocate for him to change his life circumstances. Now, when you read the story, the butler ends up being two years late. So Joseph, like, languishes for another 24 months in prison, which is not fair. Apparently, the cupbearer could have done some work on punctuality. He needed to send himself, like, a voice memo is what he needed to do. But when he did remember to advocate for Joseph, it changed his life. For some of you, this is a key to professional kindness. Some of you are in a workplace... And uh, regardless of how nice people in West Michigan tend to be, there's still um, some backbiting, there's some competition, there's some scratching and clawing and lying to get to the top. I know none of this happens in your workplaces. I've heard this has happens in some workplaces. And if you advocate for somebody, 
their character or their skills, it could open incredible doors for them. It could mean that you recommend someone for a proposal, that you write them a glowing and sincere reference letter. It could be that you give them a LinkedIn endorsement. Or it could be that you uh, expand their network by introducing them to someone who can help them. But promotional kindness is when you promote somebody else's status through your leverage. You use and steward your reputation and your resources to advance another person's standing. That's kindness. That is promotional kindness. Somebody else gets promoted in life as a result of your advocacy on their behalf. Here's another one. Plentiful kindness. Plentiful kindness is generosity. In plentiful kindness, we say, I share out of my abundance with you. Ruth chapter 2 says that Ruth, who came back from Moab to Judah with her mother-in-law Naomi, she went as a guest laborer to a field. Now in ancient times, this is a very sophisticated form of welfare. They wanted to make sure that people who are hungry could still eat, but they didn't want to like enable them with handouts. So what they did is they would, they would glean, they would harvest like 98% of a field, but they would know that like right around the edges of that field, they wouldn't they wouldn't go all the way to the full extent of their property to get every last kind of ounce of grain. They would leave some around the edges so that people who didn't have any land or people who didn't have any resources could come behind the harvesters and pick up anything that they missed. And so that's what Ruth got to do at this man named Boaz's field. She got to be a, a guest laborer. She got to follow behind the paid staff and pick up the leftovers so that she could feed herself and her mother-in-law. And one day she came home with a ton of food. And Naomi asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working at. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not show stopped showing his kindness to the living, us, and the dead, our husbands. Now, Boaz was fortunate enough to have more than he needed to share with people who were in want. The cost for Boaz's gift was minimal to the impact that it had on Ruth and Naomi. In the next 30 days, you might give $50 to someone that will feel like 100 to them. Or you could feel, give 100 to somebody and it will feel like 500 or more. And maybe it's not money that you give in generosity. Maybe you decide to be generous with your praise. Maybe your gift is a well-timed phone call or an encouraging text. There's all sorts of options on this list for you to choose from. You never know what a kind word or a thoughtful note can mean to somebody who is struggling. Because my guess is every single one of us has been on the receiving end of those at, at some point in our life, right? Right? That you've had something going on in your life that you haven't even confessed to anybody. And somebody out of the blue said, how's it going? God put you on my mind to pray for you today. And there have been times in my life where that was the lifeline for me to be reminded that I was not alone. That God still saw me. And God cared about me. And God had put people in my life to be his kind hands. Lots of different ways that kindness can touch somebody's life. It could be that, it could be what? That passive kindness of forgiveness. It could be permissive kindness of hospitality. It could be proximate kindness of blessing. It, it, it could be promotional kindness where we advance somebody else. It could be plentiful kindness where we show acts of generosity. But finally, there's, this, there's another dimension of kindness. There's a supernatural dimension of kindness called powerful kindness. And this is a healing kindness. This is where we pray for God's power to be at work in you. This is where we say, I don't have the ability to touch or transform this person's life, but Christ in me can and does and will. And one of my favorite snapshots of this type of kindness is found in Acts chapter 3. It says, one day Peter and John, who are early followers of Jesus, were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. 
Now, what, were, what were lame people banking on back in that day? Mahibosheth got what? He got a blank check from David so that he could, he, he could feed his family. Well, these guys weren't kings, and this guy was a beggar. He would take pennies from anybody who had anything to spare. So when he saw Peter and Jen about to, John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And because the people had never seen anything like it, they're like, wait a second, 20 minutes ago, this guy couldn't walk, and now he's dancing around the plaza. What gives? And Peter and John took advantage of that opportunity to tell the life-transforming story of Jesus to everyone who was there. But because they had been commanded not to preach publicly about Jesus, they were arrested. So later on the chapter, we, like later on in the book, next chapter, chapter 4, we find out that they're on trial. And when they give their own defense, again, these guys are n never went to law school a day in their lives, like professional fishermen. They said this, if we were being called to account today for an act of kindness showed to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this man stands before you healed. Here's what I love about it. They said, hey, if we're in trouble because of an act of kindness, throw us in jail. Like if the, if the law that we broke was showing kindness, and here's what I love, they didn't say we performed a miracle. They said, we gave an act of kindness. Now, I don't know if there's any more transforming act of kindness than giving somebody their body back after a lifetime of not having full use of their legs. For him, it meant that he could re-engage society. For him, it meant that he could participate in worship. It meant that he could have a, a meaningful job to provide for those people that he cared about. Kindness opens doors for divine intervention. And you know what I love about it? Peter and John didn't roll out of bed that day and say, like, hey, let's heal somebody. That'll be awesome. What were they doing? They were just going through their day. Like, there's, there, they, like, looked at their Google calendar and it said, it's like, there's prayer at three. Okay, we're going to prayer at three. But they had spiritual peripheral vision that said, there could be somebody that God brings on our radar that we have the opportunity to serve in Jesus' name. And it could be in a small way or it could be in a great way. Peter's like, if I had, here's the great part. Peter's like, if I had 50 cents, I would give you 50 cents. I don't. All I can give you is your life back. And so many of us, just I personally need to be reminded that the act of kindness that might start with a small gesture could snowball into something that I could never even imagine. And I believe that the acts of kindness that are infused with the Holy Spirit open doors for people's entire lives to be transformed. And we, when we partner with God in acts of kindness, when we cultivate practices of kindness, we win a front row seat into the miraculous power of God at work. So go, go through this list again. Look at all of the people that have been touched by a form of kindness, either from a person or from God, whether it was Lot or Naomi or Mahibosheth or Joseph or Ruth or an unnamed lame man. All of them were transformed by kindness. The question that I want to ask is, whose life will be transformed by yours? Whose life will be transformed by your kindness? Through acts both great and small that unfold over this 30-day journey that we're all going to try to do together. So again, I want to remind you to grab your tracker. Uh, you can get one at the info desk. You can also download a version of this uh, on your own. It starts next Sunday. It starts on the first day of November. Uh, you can also get more information about this on the website, centralholland.org. But there's one great gift that, allows, that this allows you to do as well, and that's to get an accountability partner. To check in with a small group leader or a friend that will help you stick with this plan. Now, why is that important? Because oftentimes, what we think we're saying and what people hear us saying are not always the same thing. Have you ever found that out? Somebody says communication isn't words said, it's words received. I'll give you an example. 
a week ago, my son was having his very last um, fifth and sixth grade football game of the season. And the, everything was on the line. Like there should not be any marbles at stake for a fifth grade football game. There was. Because they were one, one, and one. And if they won this game, then they had a winning record. And if they didn't, then they didn't. I don't know why I cared, but I did. And, they, and, 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 and the game was getting a little bit heated. And at one point, the guy that my son was lining up at against as H-back, their defensive end, he got hurt on one of the plays. Now, typically, the protocol is if you're officially hurt, you take yourself out of the game. This kid didn't do that. So I was like, if you're going to play hurt, I'm going to let him know so we can capitalize on this momentary weakness. And so I told Joe, I'm like, your guy is limping. Just be aware of that going into the next play. And our, our assistant coach, Dave, grabbed me. He's like, Steve, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm, I'm trying to exploit a weakness. I'm like, I'm just, this is the equivalent of saying that his shoes are untied. He's like, that's not what anybody else hears you saying. What they hear you saying is, kick this kid when he's down. Like, let's wring the life out of his tiny little neck. And I was like, I wasn't saying that at all. He's like, that's what people are hearing. Stop talking. <laughs> you know why we need accountability? Because <laughs> what we're saying is not always what we think we're saying. Our best efforts at kindness could be falling drastically short of what the people that we're trying to be kind to receive. So it's clear to you that I need as much help as I can get. It takes a village to raise a Steve, okay? <laughs> but these are the moments, aren't they? The, these are the moments in which our lives choose to express the kindness of Jesus Christ or not. Kindness is where the rubber meets the road. Kindness is where we decide what we're doing with our hands. And if we watch what we're doing with our hands, we can figure out where our lives are headed. And if we can evaluate the kindness meter in our relationships, we can predict with 1,000% certainty the future of those relationships. And if you have a relationship right now that feels wobbly, if you have been less than kind, and maybe you've got your reasons, maybe you're scared, Maybe you're struggling with anxiety. Maybe you feel like your life is spinning out of control. You're not trying to be hurtful. You're just trying to survive. But because your emotional and spiritual tank is running on fumes, you have nothing to give to other people. That's why I just want you to come back to what we said at the very beginning of the service. God, I need Christ in me to do what I cannot do, to feel what I cannot feel, to think what I cannot think, to say what I cannot say, because I have bloodied my knuckles and ripped off my fingernails trying to crawl out of this hole. I can't do it. And the good news is that what? Jesus loves to answer that prayer. Jesus wants his kindness to burst forth out of our lives into the lives of others. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to ask God to lead you on the next step on your kindness journey. And maybe, maybe for you, like it is for me, this kindness project will be part of it. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you that your kindness to us is boundless. That you are gracious to us. That, that for those of us who are still breathing, even in all the wrong that we've done over the course of our lives, you show mercy to us by giving us a second chance. And there are some of us today, Lord, who just need to acknowledge that, that where we have wronged you and others, we apologize. The Bible calls it, we repent. We admit our wrongdoing and the consequences that it has had on us and on others, and we ask you to change us. The Bible talks about you switching out our heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh, a heart that's soft, a heart that's compassionate, a heart that is warm and kind. And God, I pray that you would go before us on this journey and allow us to, be a, to mirror your kindness to us, to everyone we see. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.